Hi everyone, Anthony Castano here, the internet's busiest music nerd! And it is time for another installment of our ongoing Worst Two Best series, where I go over what I feel are the worst two best records in a particular artist's discography, studio album discography. In, in this installment, Outkast, the beloved, legendary, groundbreaking Atlanta hip-hop duo Andre 3000 and Big Boy, together with Organized Noise, their usual production team, Outkast has made some of the greatest hip-hop music of all time. Inventive and cutting edge and chock full of personality, over the course of their discography, Outkast had a sound like no other. I mean, not only were they getting to particular sounds and ideas and fusions of genres first, long before many others would, but they would go on to inspire countless artists that we know and love today. Contemporaries who are on the cutting edge themselves at the moment, like Kendrick Lamar, and even artists who extend beyond the galaxy of hip hop, because Outkast's music was legitimately that good that it trans Ascended cultural and genre boundaries. All right, let's rank these records. Uh, ba bam! Idlewild is the sixth and final album from Outkast. It served as the soundtrack to a movie of the same name. And being a soundtrack album, there is a degree of creative sacrifice here. It doesn't really sound or vibe like many other records in the Outkast discography. It's also a pretty bloated project at 25 tracks too. There's a lot of filler on this thing and it's nowhere near as memorable or as wild, adventurous, and experimental as many Outkast records prior. Overall, a very weak note for the duo to end on as they haven't followed this record up with anything since. The quality of tracks on this thing varies pretty greatly. You have more traditional hip-hop leaning cuts from Big Boy. Andre 3000 is fiddling around with jazz and swing and blues. Kind of the creative split that we heard on Speaker Box and Love Below, but not nearly as bold and adventurous this time around. It's painfully obvious that Andre 3000 and Big Boy, the chemistry that they've had on previous albums, it's not really here on this soundtrack. Contextually, Idlewild isn't really remembered as one of Outkast's core records, as, again, it is a soundtrack record. It does feature some interesting ideas and powerful moments. It could have been far worse than it actually is. If this project showcases anything, it's that Big Boy and Andre at this point were just looking to split off into their own artistic directions, and that was already kind of illustrated on their previous double record, but this time around, the, the results of them continuing to stick together uh, are even less fulfilling. Next on my list is Outkast's debut album, Southern Playlistic. Now, even though this inaugural album lands on the front end of this list, that is not me messaging to you that you should ignore it and that it's a subpar release. Uh, no, that's very much not the case. The duo's biggest sin on this record, and it's not even really that big of a deal, is that they were yet to develop the distinct personalities and sound that would eventually set them apart from their 90s contemporaries. Because by the mid-90s, when this record was coming out, the West Coast had already stolen the national hip-hop spotlight with gangster rap. New York was then coming through with a more hardcore sound to match it. Meanwhile, the South was fighting to get its various scenes off the ground, and a lot of the region's early pioneers aesthetically and instrumentally sounded a lot like artists you might hear on either the East or the West Coast. It was going to be a few more years before the roots of that dirty Southern sound and what we currently know as trap would start to formulate. I mean, the most original thing going on in this area at the time was most likely the Memphis scene, which is fondly remembered for its dark, horror-inspired lyricism, eerie instrumentals, artists like 3-6 Mafia, but it would be a while before the influence of all this spread widely, which is another video entirely. So outside of their regional dialect and lyrical tone, outcasts don't sound that much different than a lot of other artists in hip-hop at the moment on the East and West Coast respectively. But the duo and organized noise do their best to put their own spin on it. The dark little bass line and the boom-bap rhythms on the track Hooty Who are one of several moments on this record that sound like something straight out of New York. Meanwhile, the flows and the funk guitars and the wavy synthesizers on the title track are almost like something lifted off of Dr. Dre's The Chronic. However, everything Outkast is doing on this record is still impressive in its own right, because the grooves, the layering, the melodies that a lot of West Coast hip-hop artists were offering around the time of this album were unmatched, but here comes Outkast and Organized Noise, and they're just like, Bam! First record, first try, we did it. On a debut album, they effortlessly achieved that same 
hookiness and lusciousness. So considering that, it should be no surprise that Outkast went as artistically far as they did down the road. Now, there are a few cuts on this record where Outkast just starts to tease towards some of the funkier and more psychedelic leanings that would come out on records like Equemini and AT Aliens, the song Claim and True, or the track Funky Ride. But for the most part, what sells Outkast's debut album isn't their originality, but the raw talent on display between Big Boy and Andre's flows and lyricism, the incredible instrumentals, and the songs that are so tight and well-assembled and infectious. And even though Outkast was just starting out on this record, Big Boy and Andre play off of each other like seasoned vets. Plus, they offered verses that were a bit more emotionally dynamic and reflective than that of their hardcore and gangsta counterparts on the East and West Coasts, especially on cuts like Deep or Get Up, Get Out or the relaxing weed anthem Crumble and Herb. And the messaging the duo was trying to get across on this record on some of the refrains, on some of the hooks, is so universally true and great and sticky that they stand to this day as some of the most uh, earwormy bits to ever come out of a hip-hop song, whether it be Ain't No Thing But A Chicken Wing, which is not a phrase the duo invented but helped popularize with the song on this record. Also, get up, get out, and get something. Even at this point, in this very early stage, Outkast was writing timeless shit, and they would only continue to get more original and more profound as their discography continued on. Next on my list is the Outkast double album, Speaker Box and The Love Below. And even though on this record there are a lot of highlights, there are a lot of great tracks, a lot of creativity to be heard, even hits like the song Hey Ya, which was gigantic when it was released, it was becoming increasingly obvious that Outkast as a duo, as a collaborative, was kind of splintering. Because Big Boy and Andre on this double record respectively each have their own side where they're just doing their own thing. And under these conditions, this record really truly could have been awful, could have been a flop, because Andre and Big Boy were very much not on the same page. Big Boy's speaker box is pretty cohesive, but a prototypical blend of hip-hop and R&B from the 2000s. It's a solid listen with the quality lyricism we've expected up until this point, maybe not as varied and as exciting as previous Outkast projects, but still, it's kind of a solo record, so it's a different thing entirely. Basically, this album is like listening to two of the greatest songwriting minds in the genre locked into this... McCartney-Lennon-like scenario where they're at odds because you have one person whose taste is a bit more pop-centric and accessible and uh, maybe even traditional, but still creative and eclectic. Meanwhile, uh, you have a voice that is far more adventurous and experimental, difficult to control, difficult to rein in, and it's like mixing oil and water effectively. On the speaker box side of things, we have some killer features from Killer Mike and Lil Jon and Jay-Z, uh, Big Boy essentially keeping up that very collaborative speech spirit that he maintains on his solo material. Meanwhile, Andre's side at some points almost has like a an old school Gorillaz vibe. Nora Jones makes an interesting appearance. The genre energy on his side of the aisle is much more focused on electronic music and funk and neo-soul. Andre does quite a bit of singing on The Love Below, which rubbed some fans the wrong way. It's still a very interesting and fulfilling project, though, with a lot of very cool nooks and crannies. And even with all of its flaws, it still stands as one of the best double albums hip-hop has to offer. Next on my list here is Equemini, essentially third from being Outkast's best record, in my opinion. It is actually their third record. It's often considered to be one of the best hip-hop albums of this era, which I think is saying a lot considering its placement on this list. Equemini is a conscious hip-hop album, sort of a high-minded hip-hop album, that doesn't come off as too preachy or annoying. The record sees Outkast experimenting quite a bit with genre fusions, bringing in elements of funk and rock and even country. For the year 1998, the production on this thing is very detailed, very clean. And believe it or not, at this point in their careers, even though Outkast already had a few successful records under their belts, artistically you could argue they had proven themselves, they were still working against these biases that were being thrown at them because they were from a region of the country that was just lower on the totem pole in terms of relevance in hip-hop. Thankfully, this record very much turned that tide, especially with features from guys like Raekwon the Chef on here, and with one incredibly great, well-produced, and lyrical song after the next, a lot of thoughtful and topical cuts throughout this record, especially the opener, Return of the G. Yet another incredibly compelling song where the duo's working against the stereotypes of 
of violence and uh, machismo going on throughout much of the genre. A lot of the beats on this record maintain a pretty spacey vibe, but nowhere near as spacey and alien and as otherworldly as we heard on AT Aliens. By comparison, Equemini is much more colorful, much funkier, though when you do compare it to later releases, it doesn't go quite as far. It's not quite as adventurous. In a way, I see Equemini as a, a bit of a middle ground between like an Outcast debut record and, and something a bit more eclectic like a Stankonia. Equemini does cram a lot of ideas into one album. It's well over an hour of material, just like the record that would follow it, though again, not quite as bold and adventurous instrumentally, uh, which in the case of this record, I do think works against it slightly. I feel it to be a, a slightly bloated album, or at least a record that I think could have used a bit more variation and color across the track list, something I think the duo's next LP does a better job of offering, even if the lyricism on this record is pretty top-notch. So even though I think Andre and Big Boy did go on to slightly more interesting things after this record, uh, that's not to take away from its overall quality. It's still an excellent, excellent album, and far more unique than a lot of what else was coming out around this time, and I will just leave it at that. Next on my list, number two from being the best, in my opinion, is the duo's second album, AT Aliens. For the Atlanta duo, this album is a pretty defining moment, and easily one of the best and most unique hip-hop albums of the 90s. So just a few years after their debut album, and not too long after their controversial appearance at the 1995 Source Awards, Outkast come through with a very bold change of pace on their sophomore release. In comparison with Southern Playalistic, uh, the instrumentals and the overall sound of AT Aliens is way more stripped back and weird and spacey. It's icy, it's kind of dark. The overall vibe of this record, it's, it's futuristic. There's almost an alien presentation to it as well, especially with the cover art over here. It's almost like we're getting a comic book sci-fi experience to the whole thing too. AT Aliens is also a fairly introspective and low-key album. Even the catchiest and most viral singles off of this record are a little sleepy. Outkast was just willing to take a huge risk on this record and come through with a, a pretty cerebral set of songs, much more cerebral than much of what was coming out at the time. Even with a fresh wave of very popular, sweet, and somewhat more mellow sounds coming out of the pop rap ranks, whether it be from the Roots or the Fugees or even to a degree Tupac's California Love, which was a pretty chill and funky and fun song. So even though the artistic presentation of this record is super subtle, Big Boy and Andre's talents continued to grow, as did their profile when this record charted far higher on the Billboard 200 than their last one did, and stayed on the Billboard 200 chart in some capacity for over 30 weeks. As far as the lyricism on this record goes, Big Boy and Andre, I think, had already set themselves apart from their contemporaries on their debut record with a lot of verses that were personal and heady and uh, kind of threw out a lot of cautionary tales and warnings, advice, and they kind of go further down that road on AT Aliens. There are quite a few tracks on this thing that I think focus on sex and dating and promiscuity, like on Babylon or Jazzy Bell, whose sentiments at this point uh, I think are a little dated, but uh, still in a way, I guess, well-meaning, as I guess they're warning people not to take their lives into their own hands just to get a quick lay. But there are other tracks on here where there's a lot of commentary on the industry, Outkast's popularity, whether it be on the song Mainstream or Elevators, Me and You. And like on their debut record, there are cuts on here that display Andre and Big Boy as outcasts, as artistic outcasts, as outcasts in the industry. But on this record, they take it a step further and portray themselves as being out of this world, which maybe at the time trying to be a famous and up-and-coming rap star in the South, it, it might have felt that way. This sentiment probably comes out the most boldly on the song E.T. Extraterrestrial. A bulk of this album's appeal, in my opinion, comes down to its incredibly unique vibe, to its very soft and subtle but sticky hooks, also its cunning quotables, as I would argue on this album Big Boy and Andre, do a much better job of coming into their own, vocally and lyrically. Big Boy and Andre have grown into these incredibly distinct personalities and voices that reinforce each other so well, especially on Wheels of Steel, or on Two Dope Boys in a Cadillac. Have to also mention the flow of this album is killer. One great track 
after the next. It all seamlessly comes together really well. There's a beautiful simplicity to this album, a power in its simplicity that I feel like very few hip-hop albums overall try to achieve. It's no fluff, it's all fire. This is Andre and Big Boy standing out, coming into their own, and going against the grain, and just, just sounding great doing it. And finally, what I see as OutKast's best album in my number one and my best spot here, Stankonia. This record came out in the year 2000, and it is what I see as OutKast's best and boldest album. Which, believe me, was not an easy choice to make considering how fantastic much of the duo's discography is. Now, every one of OutKast's records up until this point had grabbed the attention of the hip-hop world to some degree, which I will repeat again at this point, was a feat in and of itself considering how irrelevant the South was at the time in the grander scheme of things. But Stankonia put Outkast in a position where they essentially transcended all of those regional boundaries and really became a household name. That can be attributed greatly to this album's pop sensibility, its crossover appeal. I mean, what the song Miss Jackson alone did for the duo's career is gigantic. Not to mention it's easily one of the most overplayed songs of the 2000s. Now, I do have to say, maybe all of these genre crossovers and this mass appeal is what makes Stankonia less of a hip-hop purist pick for the duo's best album. That typically goes to an Equemini or an AT Aliens instead. If your opinion is more from that angle, I could see how you wouldn't really think very much of this album. But you know what? Even though Stankonia does offer some sweet moments that work well on radio, for every track that fits that bill, there's another song on this thing that's wildly weird and experimental, like a psychedelic funk hop odyssey. There's not really a moment on this album to some degree that isn't ambitious, cutting edge, catchy, or strange as far as length and material. It also goes the distance like Equemini did, but it offers so much more in terms of variation and sound. Even though this album had gigantic commercial appeal for Outkast, so many of the deep cuts on this thing artistically are way off the beaten path. Even further off than much of what they've done up until this point. In a lot of ways, I see Stankonia as the shape of hip-hop to come. As on this album, Big Boy and Andre pushed an emotional depth and a genre breadth that no other hip-hop artists at the time were. And wouldn't for a while, because keep in mind, this record came out long before we had Kanye polarizing people and blowing minds with his auto-tuned opus, 808s and Heartbreak, and... My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, and all of the electro-pop fusions of Graduation. Not to mention this record was coming through with quirky, weirdo fusions of pop and rap before Gorillaz would do the same, too. If you want to talk about records that are ahead of the curve and challenge listeners to get out of their comfort zones, Stankonia is it. And not only is this record ahead, but it's also really well executed. It has so many facets and phases and nooks and crannies to it. I love the weird interstitial bits that bring us from one segment to the next, and the these like football huddle break lines that kind of bring us from one track or moment to the next. The skits on this thing and the interludes are consistently creative and hilarious. There are excellent explosive rock tinged bangers on here like Gasoline Dreams and Bombs of a Baghdad. Also supremely sweet and slick spots on this thing like so fresh so clean. Meanwhile snapping and trapping, Toilet Tisha, and I'll call before I come. <laughs> Uh, I think still stand as some of the weirdest things to ever come out of the South in terms of hip-hop ever. Meanwhile, Explosion with Be Real of Cypress Hill fame, as well as Erica Badu on this record, stand as some of the most essential hip-hop features of the 2000s. I also love that Outkast take the time to show some Southern hospitality to Gangsta Boo on I'll Call Before I Come, making that very necessary 3-6 Mafia connection there. While for many people this record may be a difficult listen because of how wild and varied it is and how much some of the more low-key cuts really demand from the listener, especially the closer, which is like a really weird sexual space fantasy. <laughs> Despite all the weirdness and the oddity of this album, you gotta give it to this record. Because how many hip-hop albums sound like this, man, even to this day? I think this album is still not appreciated to the degree that it could be. As many fans seem to more favor releases in Outkast's discography that have a more 
traditional or consistent or predictable tone to them. Meanwhile, as far as my preferences go, I, I very much appreciate and embrace the madness of this record. I find it to be so colorful, so chock full of character. Big Boy's verses are fantastic. The flows on this record throughout are so amazing and intense, especially the verse and flow that Andre brings on the opening to Bombs Over Baghdad, one of many killer moments on this thing. The story and the details of Miss Jackson that Big Boy brings to the table. The hilarious We Love These Hoes, as well as the killer posse cut gangsta shit. It's just one great, wild, insane moment after the next where, despite the fact that Big Boy and Andre seem to be in very different creative places, they were still very much complementing each other really well. It's sad to know that things kind of fractured past this point, but still, uh, I guess it's better to have loved and lost and at least gotten to this incredible peak of creativity uh, than to have never experienced it at all. And I will leave it at that. Uh, that is my outcast worst to best. Thank all of you for watching. Tran, Zishin, before I end this video off, I want to give a huge shout out to Philip over at Volksgeist who co-wrote this video with me. Over here is a link to his channel. Please do uh, subscribe to him and check out his stuff. He comes out with some very good music essays himself. Let me know down in the comments what you guys would rank all of these Outcast albums like from worst to best, and I would love some uh, suggestions on what the next worst to best should be. Thank you very much. Um, you're the best, you're the best, you're the best. Anthony Fantano, worst to best forever.